Sweet. Good morning. How are y'all doing? Good. All the feedback, I'm eating it up already. Uh, my name is Brandon Shiley, and like she said, I'm the student coordinator at our uh, Five Forks campus. And this is actually my first time ever being with y'all on a Sunday morning here, and so I am just super excited, um, especially because Dallas is one of my closest friends. He's truly my mentor, and so to be here, um, to kind of fill in for him this week, I'm honored and, again, just like cannot say it enough how excited I am to be here worshiping with you guys. And so today we're stepping into a new series. We've been in Revelation for 12 weeks now, and so I'm sure some of y'all are taking the biggest sigh of relief uh, because that was a long time, but it was so good, and we finished strong on Easter Sunday this past week. And now we're getting the chance to step into Um, a series called Skeptical over the next six weeks. And so just thinking about that, I know that we've got lots of just naturally skeptical people in the room. Like maybe you've been told and promised a lot of things over the span of your life and people have just like failed to live up to those expectations. I know for me, like that is the story of my life when it comes to sports, all right? And so if you wanna know anything about me, One thing is that I am a diehard South Carolina fan, especially when it comes to football. We got somebody in the back. There we go. That's what I'm talking about. Um, If you know anything about South Carolina football, one word to describe it, um, its state of the the program over the past five years would be the word disappointment, okay? Um, And I, I love them to death. But somehow, maybe it's through promotion, maybe it's through social media, they somehow convince their entire fan base that, that this is the year every single year. And I'm the guy that believes them. Like, I'm like, all right, like, I think this is it. I think they've, they've I just watched a hype video. This is so fun. We're going to do it this year. And every year I'm disappointed. And then I, I get to this year. Again, it's the same thing. Like South Carolina Gamecocks fans, get ready, buckle up. This is our year. And I'm just like, really? Like, like we were five and seven last year. We just lost all of our best players. And this is the year? Like, I'm just so skeptical to that entire idea because I've been heartbroken so many times. Uh, But just in general, we're skeptical people. We're skeptical people. And here today, I know there are people who have walked into this place with a lot of like heavy questions surrounding God's word, surrounding who he is, like whether like this thing that we do, this God we worship is real, whether it's even worth it, if he is. And I think one of the main questions at the root of all that is surrounding this book. Like is, is the Bible really God's word? Is it really trustworthy? Like if you, if you think about the state of this book, a book that was written over the span of 1,500 years, there's 66 different books that make it up, written by 45 different authors, you're like, man, can I, can I really trust this thing? Like, is, is what it says, is it really have authority over my life? And I know there are people here that you come into this place and you're like, hey, I've just grown up believing this is God's word. My parents told me that, I grew up in church and I've just always taken it for that. If that's you, like that is a really good thing. You should be proud of that. However, it's also okay if you're like, man, I've got a lot of questions like, I really, I really need to, to have a few questions answered on whether this book is trustworthy. And just this morning, I, I know I'm not going to be the, the last person to tell you this, but I'm excited to be the first person. If you have questions about all this, about this whole Christianity thing, about who God is, like, let me just say, like, you are in the perfect place. Like, we, we are so excited that, that you are here. Because one thing that God has proven to me over the last few years is that God is not afraid of your doubt. Like he's not afraid of your questions, like the biggest questions of why, God, why would you allow this terrible thing to happen to me? God, this seems too hard to believe. God, what is, what is the deal here? I can promise you God is not afraid of your questions. Even coming out of the, the Easter week, one of my, my favorite like, stories and people to, to sit in, because I, I just relate to him, is the, the story of Doubting Thomas. And y'all know him. He walked with Jesus for, for three years. He saw Jesus do so many miracles, so much ministry. He was there with Jesus. 
when Jesus warned them, like, there's coming a day when I'm going to die and I'm going to come back to life. Like, Thomas, like, actually heard all of those things. And then when it happened, he said, there's no way. Like, there's no way I'm going to believe unless I see the very scars, unless I, unless I feel his wounds. There's no way I'm going to believe. And at that point, Jesus had every reason to be like, are you kidding me? Like, I've, I've shown you everything. I gave you the warnings. Like, you've been with me through all of this. Are you kidding me? I can't believe you would say that. That's not Jesus' reaction. Instead, he invites them in. He says, come and see. Like, come, come and feel the very wounds. Like, let me just assure you this morning, God's heart is for you to believe. Like, he doesn't want you to sit in, into, like, in confusion. He wants to draw you near to himself. That is his heart, and that's why I believe you are in the perfect spot this morning to have some of your hard questions answered. And so, man, I, I'm excited for this series. It's going to be unique as we look to some things like historical sources outside the Bible while also looking to God's very word for what we believe. And what I want us to walk away with this morning is this truth that God's word is not only reliable, but it's relevant to our lives. Like it actually, it, it matters. It's worth building your life on. And just up front, hear me when I say, as a church, we believe that God's word is perfect. It's infallible, it's inerrant, and again, it is worth building your life on. And so, nevertheless, surrounding God's word, I believe there are two truths that we need to answer. The first one is this, where did God's word come from? Where did God's word come from? I would say most of the time when, when speaking on the nature of scripture, we start in 2 Timothy chapter three. And so if you have your Bibles, you can go ahead and turn there with me this morning. 2 Timothy chapter three. Now I'm gonna start reading in verse 16. Paul says this, it's on the screen if you don't have your Bibles. It says, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So that's where we start, by believing that the words that we see here are breathed out by God. Maybe you're holding a translation that says it's inspired by God. And I know that while that is true, I think sometimes that word may leave us astray, like lead us astray because it's not inspiration in the sense of like an artist may have inspiration to, to paint a painting or to, to write a piece of music. It's not just sheer motivation. Because to be honest, there are a ton of religious books that have been made over the past thousands of years that are motivated by the idea of knowing God. And those things aren't worth building your life on. However, this is different because we don't believe it's just motivated by the idea of a God. We believe this is spoken to us from God's mouth himself. So that's where we have to start here. It's not like it's just inspired. We, we believe it's expired, like air leaving your very lungs. This is what we believe about the holy scriptures, straight from the mouth of God. This is what 2 Peter has to say. Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. It's, it's the dual authorship there. Man and God. And I was even talking to Dallas about it this past week, and I love the way he explained it. It just made sense in my head. Scripture is written from the mouth of God by the hand of man. By the mouth of God and the hand of man. It's not just general ideas about God. It's not just a record of all the events that were taking place around Jesus. This is God speaking. And so that's where we have to start, believing that, knowing that. But I'm also aware that for, for people in the room, that the skeptic in the room, that doesn't answer all your questions necessarily. Like, again, we might need to look at something outside of Scripture that shows us, like, the way this book was formed. Like, we can trust it. Because, again, there are books, like other religious books, that include more 
than the 66 books here. So how do I know that these are the exact right ones that God has for us? Am I missing something? Did we add too much? How can I have like faith in this book? And so maybe you don't have those questions, but I do know there are people in your walks of life that do. And so this, this idea, this topic, it really does matter. And so you've maybe heard this term before, but the word that describes this is the word canon. C-A-N-O-N, and it's basically the list of books that are deemed as authoritative from God. Even like the very word canon itself, it means measuring stick. It's a measuring rod. And, and the best way I can explain how this works regarding the Bible, it's like you go into an amusement park, and before you wait in a long line, like you're right on the border on whether you're going to be tall enough or not, you go and you stand next to the, the height stick, you go stand next to the rod to see if you're qualified to ride the rod. It's not that the, the stick itself like gives you the qualifications fit to ride the rod. You already had them. The measuring stick just, just demonstrates whether you contained the right qualifications or not. It's the exact same way. Just like you have to meet the standards to get on a roller coaster ride, you have to meet the standards as a book to make it inside of God's word. There was a certain standard that was set to be scripture. And if you're taking notes, there's three qualities that mattered when when people, when they were forming the Bible, looked at to see whether it was scripture. The first one is, is the book apostolic? That's a fancy word for saying, was it written by an apostle or someone who was closely tied to one? An apostle is someone who just saw Jesus with their own eyes. And so what this tells us immediately is this, is that the books written here must have been written around the time of Jesus. Like there, there's no such thing as adding more books to the Bible now. Like as much as we love Dallas, as much as I think we all read a book if he wrote it, like his book ain't the Bible. Like there's no such thing as adding things to this book because it had to be written by someone who was an apostle or closely tied to one. So that was the first criteria. The second one is this. Was it universally accepted? And so, like we know, that we're not the first believers to ever read the Bible. Like, there's been a, a line of saints throughout history that encountered these books, and we value the, the early church's opinion when they were, like, fresh off the press, like when, they were, when Paul was actually writing these what did those people believe about these books? And there were some books, there were some letters that like everyone at the time knew, like, okay, this is, this is God's word. And there were some early church fathers, they didn't cite these letters as, as God's word. Like we believe that Paul wrote letters that didn't make it here because it wasn't God's word. And so that's where we have to, we have to look to see, was it universally accepted by the early church. If you study, it's so cool because the early church was spread out everywhere, Europe, Asia, Africa, and all across the world in separate places, people were coming to the same conclusion on what is God's word. It points to it being, it's, it's inherently divine. And the last thing, so if you're taking, the last quality is orthodoxy, which is a fancy word again for does what we're looking at is what we're measuring does it contradict anything that was already written? Because we know that God doesn't contradict himself. And so these are the three qualities that make up, is a book canonical? Does it fit the requirements of being from God? And I know like maybe even seeing this, it may seem foreign. Like why does this matter? But again, it matters because people have added books to the Bible that we don't believe belong there. You may have a friend who, who is a Catholic, and they believe in the Apocrypha, just like a case study on most. Some books that are in between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And I just want to tell you, we have good reason to believe that those things are not God-breathed. Because again, if we hold it up to the standard, those three qualities, we believe, A, it wasn't accepted by the early church. They, they read them. We have people saying that these things are helpful, but never were they attested to as spoken by God. It really wasn't until the 1500s that people put those books in the Bible. And also there are contradictory teachings. So very like immediately we see that these things aren't God's word. 
I know that was a lot, but I say all of that to say this, that not anything and everything that has ever been written about God made it in this book. So what that means is that you are holding nothing less than God's direct authority over your life. That when you read this book and when it doesn't make sense, when you read this book and you don't even agree with it, you go into it knowing that God is right and you are wrong. Because nothing just like crept in by accident. Nothing's here like unintentionally. Every word intentionally written by God himself. And so when you have so much like bitterness harvesting up in your heart and God has laid out a very hard path of reconciliation, you believe that God is right and you are wrong. When God's way of stewarding your finances or maybe God's way of just overall obedience to him is so foreign to everything else culture has to say, God is right and his word is authority. That's the lens in which we approach scripture. And so where does this book come from? And it comes straight from the mouth of God. And you as a Christian, like you don't have to feel like you've been pushed into a corner that, man, people have got some, like, witty arguments that can disprove this book. Man, I want you to know, leaving here today, that you should have confidence that this book is authoritative, it's true, it's reliable, and you can bank your life on it. So where does it come from? It comes straight from the mouth of God. And the second question, where I want to spend our rest of our time today, is what were these scriptures given for? What were the scriptures given for? I'm going to reread that same passage we already read, this time including two more verses. So starting in verse 14 of 2 Timothy chapter 3, it says this, But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you've learned it, and how from childhood you have acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, in Christ Jesus. Again, all scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So the ultimate question is, if we believe this is from God, it's spoken to us, like, okay, that's true. Why does it matter? Like this was written 2,000 years ago. Does anything in this book apply to my life? Like how I'm living, going to school, going to work, raising it. Like does this really apply to me? And I want you to see here this morning that everything in this book is, rel- like is relevant to our life. Everything is profitable. This idea of being relevant is one that, that circles my mind a lot, especially in the like, student ministry world and like world of like youth pastors everyone's wondering like how can we stay relevant like how can we make sure like middle schoolers and high schoolers like still think we're cool and I'm gonna be honest like I'm not old like I'm 24 but like the idea of 25 is genuinely freaking me out right now I'm like I'm just so scared of getting out of the loop um I love my dad so much um, but he's lost it. Like, I, I, I think he's lost the lingo. Like, he'll ask me all the time. He's like, Brandon, like, I saw what you posted on Instachat today. And I'm like, I, I've told you this, Dad. There's Instagram. There's Snapchat, which I don't have. But what you just said, Instachat doesn't exist, all right? And, like, so that, that idea is just getting very, very scary for me. I'm like, how can I make sure, like, I'm caught up with the lingo, I'm caught up with everything, and like, again, like last year, for example, like I'm, I'm hanging out with a, a student or two and they're like, man, we just got ice cream the other day. Like I got ice cream with Parker and it just hit so hard. I'm like, why would Parker hit you over a cup of ice cream, bro? Like, do I need to get involved? Like what is going on? If you don't know that the word it hit means it was good. I, I learned that too a year ago. And so it's just this like constant thing of like, okay, how can I make sure I stay relevant? And then we fall into this trap of like, okay, well, if it's so hard to stay relevant, how do we keep this relevant? Like, how do we keep this at the forefront of our minds? Like, what do I need to change about it to make sure it applies to the next generation? And hear me when I say this book has 
everything to do with your life right now. It has everything to do with you. In three ways we see that. The first thing is that it makes us wise into salvation. If you look back to verse 15, it's relevant because it makes you wise into salvation. Scripture, we believe, contains everything it was intended to contain. Like God, again, there's no missing pieces. He didn't leave anything out. Now, that doesn't mean that every question you could ever have may be answered in the Bible. It doesn't mean that like all the history and science questions you have may be answered. Like again, I believe that a lot of them can be answered using the scriptures, but maybe not all of them. However, it's sufficient because it includes everything you need to live a life of godliness and faith in Jesus. In that, the most important thing, what it was intended, what it was created for, it's lacking nothing for you to live a life of godliness. The scriptures are completely sufficient. And even as I was like thinking through it and praying through this, this sermon, and like if there was a big point that I wanted us to walk away with, like I just want us to leave here today like truly believing like that this word has power. Like in it, when it's spoken, when it's preached, when it's read, like it has the power to change things. And I believe that with my whole heart. I think back to the time when you accepted Jesus. I would be willing to bet that you didn't decide to follow Jesus because someone convinced you with some crazy argument that they laid out all the proofs of the Bible and of God right before you. And you're like, okay, like that makes sense. I believe my bet is that someone spoke the gospel, preached the word over you and the power of God opened your eyes and it changed your life. I heard a pastor say this one time, I, I thought it was so good. He says, the word of God is foolishness to the world until one day it just isn't. And I believe this, like I've seen it with my own eyes that you preach this word, it doesn't make sense. And one day, because the word is God's word and it contains power, it'll change people's lives, it'll make sense and it'll flip their world upside down. And I'm just here to tell you, it makes you wise in salvation. And so if you're in this room, hear this that, man, you're a sinner, man, that you've fallen short of the glory of God, but God made a way for you to know him by dying on the cross and rising again three days later, and that very message will change your life. Paul, in just the, the way he, he preaches, has really, like, inspired me, like, how do I want to preach? How do I want to share God's word? In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, I'm going to read verses one through five, it's gonna be on the screen. Paul says, and I, when I came to you brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my message were not implausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Two reasons why I believe that matters so much. First, I believe that you should have confidence in sharing the gospel. What Paul says here is this, like Paul had all the best arguments. He had all the wise words. He had all like, I believe like just the crafty ways to convince you of God. And I believe he had those in his back pocket, but he left them there because he believed just Jesus and Jesus crucified, that message in itself is more powerful. Like anything that I could say, anything that you could say in sharing the gospel, it doesn't beat the message that Jesus died on the cross for your sins. That's where the power is. That changes everything, and that should give you confidence. So first, it gives you confidence in sharing the gospel. But secondly, I believe just very practically in caring for your friends, like I think I feel the pressure, so me, a lot of times, like, I just want, like, the one, like, wise, very practical, like, life experience that I can share with somebody that they walk away being like, wow, that was so good. We often want to, and that's a good, I think there's a place for, like, practical sharing advice of things. However, it still doesn't beat God's word. Like, I convince myself that maybe if I share this verse, it's basic, it's cliche, and I believe that this word spoken over people for, like, actually provides freedom and changes things. 
And so knowing this, again, this is the word that's sufficient and it has power and it makes us wise unto salvation. Secondly, I believe the Bible, it gives us a look into the deepest parts of my heart. Like the parts of your heart that you don't even see, you can't understand fully. I think the Bible helps us see those things. Hebrews 4, chapters 12 through, or verses 12 through 13 says this, For the word of God is living and active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of the soul and of the spirit, of the joints and marrow, and of discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Two truths surround this verse. Again, one, you you got to believe that we're all sinners. And the very nature of sin is this, is that it hardens your heart. It like, it really does blind you from seeing reality as it truly is. It, sin is. Sin is blinding. But the word of God is the sword that can pierce beyond the hardness of sin. It's truly the only thing that can do that. It, it can expose the motives and intentions of your heart that you don't even understand why they're there. I love the way John Piper puts it. He says this, the word of God is living and active and penetrates to the bottoms of our lives and rips the pleasant mask off the ugly face of sin. Man, I believe this. You've got some things in your heart that aren't good. They aren't right. They're ugly but they're disguised by something. You can't see it for what it truly is. But God's work can expose it. And so to nevertheless, to go through life without God's word is to willingly go through life blind. It's to go through life like choosing that I'm not going to use the lamp into my feet and the light into my path. You're making that choice. I need to believe there are things that I can't, again, I can't put my finger on it. Brandon, why are you feeling this way? Why are you thinking this way? Why are these things coming up? There are things that you can't put your finger on that God's word will expose and bring to the surface where freedom can be found there. Like that happens through reading his word. And to go through life thinking that you don't need to read this, because again, that you've maybe read it one time from cover to cover, that you know the gist of what it says. To believe that about the Bible shows me that you don't know what this book really is. God has spoken to you. He's not leaving you in the dark, but he's giving you a way. He's trying to establish your steps. And yet some of us will say that we don't have time to read this book. Some of us make the case that there's a lot going on. There's some things I need to figure out. There are more important things I need to get straight and then I have, I'll have the real time to dive into God's word. And I heard this at the men's conference this past year. It was super helpful for me to think through like why I read God's word. A lot of us, we treat reading God's word like a cup of coffee in the morning. Like we want it to provide that initial kick to our day. We want it to be the energy boost that we're exactly looking for. And while I do believe the Bible is that sometimes, I believe there's gonna be some mornings where the, your Bible reading is so sweet. Like it's so good, it's exactly what you needed. But I'll be vulnerable enough to say, that's not what it feels like for me most of the time. And if that's not what it feels like for you, that's also okay. Because more than that, I think it's helpful to think through reading the Bible like it's like taking a vitamin. You don't see the kick of it every single day, but you'll look back and be like, I'm stronger. Like me doing this daily has healed some wounds. It's made me more, more whole. And even though I didn't even feel it every single day, I can look back and see how that changed my life. That's how we should approach reading God's word. I believe you might not see it every day. It may not be the warm, bubbly feeling that you wish it would be, but I believe it's gonna renew your heart and mind in a way that only the power of God's word can do. So it exposes, it exposes our heart. And then lastly, it trains us for every good work. That's how that 2 Timothy passage ends. It says that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. I believe this. It starts because as you read God's word, you'll begin to love what he loves. 
You'll begin to hate what he hates. The sin that once, once tasted so good, you'll have a distaste for it. And the things of God will become so sweet. And as he changes your heart, as he gives you a longing for his presence, you'll see that you're more equipped to do the very things that God's called you to do in scriptures. And what's sad is that, I mean, I've heard it before. Some of us, we don't know what to do. We're like, I don't know what God has calling me to do, what he's told me to do. Like, I wish that God would just speak. Like, I wish that God would just tell me straight up. With his audible voice, he would just tell me where to go. What's the right path? And so many of them have not even dared to open up what God has already spoken through his word. If you haven't started there, if you haven't done what God's already told you to do, why would he tell you to do anything different? We got to start here in his word. He trains you to be the man and woman of God that you're called to be. The good works that he prepared for you before the foundation of the world. This is where you get equipped for it. And so as we, just, as we close here today, I just want to read a psalm over us. Psalm 119. The whole thing is like 200 verses long. But I'm going to read like eight verses. Y- y- y'all had a heart attack. I could feel the air leave the room. Uh, we're going to make it lunch. But there are a few verses in here that I just think just, just show us, that give us a glimpse into the beauty of Scripture. Psalm 119, just reading seven verses, starting in verse 161. It says, Princes persecute me without cause, but my heart stands in awe of your words. I rejoice at your word like one who finds great spoil. I hate and abhor falsehood, but I love your law. Seven times a day, I praise you for your righteous rules. Great peace have those who love your law. Nothing can make them stumble. I hope for your salvation, O Lord, and I do your commandments. My soul keeps your testimonies. I love them exceedingly. I keep your precepts and testimonies for all my ways are before you. Like this is the word of God that he's spoken to you. They're the words that just keep getting more beautiful the more and more you read them. It's the wisdom that amounts to more than treasure. They're the commands that aren't burdensome, but like actually provide freedom. They are the words that give us peace, that don't let us stumble. It's the wisdom that makes straight the path of God. It's the equipping that you need to be complete in your walk with Jesus. And so I close by just asking you this question, is this book your treasure. The Bible says it's worth being your treasure. It's worth being in that spot. Is it your treasure? Because I believe once it is, this is, this is when things will start to change. But for some of us, man, this doesn't, this doesn't leave, leave the nightstand for more than 10 minutes a week. For some of us, we, we read for five minutes a day on our phone but it's just in the middle of all the the distractions, the notifications that pop up on your phone. For some of us, it's really good head knowledge. It's fun to learn about, but this book has never taken root in your heart and changed your life. Man, I I believe this. This this book, the Jesus that it points to, should take second place to nothing. But if you were to look at your life, if you were to look at the list of of your priorities and how you spend your time, this wouldn't even crack your top 10. And I just wanna, I wanna say this because this is true about everybody in every situation of life. No matter how busy you are, no matter what's going on, you will always make time for what's most important to you. Every single day, it's a fact that's always true. You always make time for what's most important to you. So looking at your week this past week, does this book even resemble your treasure? From the outside looking in, do people think you built your life on this truth? I believe there's nothing better that you can do. It's worth your time. It's worth, your, it's worth the best time you have to offer God every single day. Because this book changes things and it has power. It's reliable. It's relevant. Is it your treasure? Let's pray. Um, Jesus, we love you so much. And just so thankful for who you are, God. Um, I pray for 
the, the person in this room who again just has a lot of questions surrounding your word, surrounding who you are, this whole Christianity thing. And God, I'm praying as we've read today that your power, that your word spoken would change things. And I pray they come back to hear the preaching of your word, to have more questions answered. God, I pray that you provide peace in the middle of all the doubts. God, I pray for the believer in this room who they say they're a follower, they say they're faithful, God, but, but they haven't opened this book for themselves in a really long time. God, I'm praying that what's true about Upstate Church Haywood, what's true about every family in this room is that this book is their treasure. That it's our, it's our map, God, that it's our light and that it would expose the areas of our heart believing that this would draw us so closely to you. And so God, would, we, would you just help us? Would you give us the strength and the grace to fall in love with your truth and your word and ultimately your son Jesus who died on the cross for our sins? Lord, we love you so much. We ask this in your son Jesus Christ's name.